know, of sort of the environmental sciences um, in general. Uh, and if you remember, um, as a result of that, you know, uh, context, um, environmental sciences and funding for climate change research was deeply problematic from the start. Remember, that's, you know, what we were discussing. And we, it's all of us, absent that sort of knowledge of the politicization of environmental science and even more so environmental communications from the very start, absent that context, that historical context, it's almost impossible for any of us to sort of imagine that this image does not generate for all of us the awe, beauty, and compassion, and care, and inspiration um, that we readily, and as environmental communicators, we have readily ascribed to it. In fact, this does generate awe, beauty, and care for a select group of people who belong to certain cultural worldviews for whom this symbol and this icon will continue to work. That symbol, this icon, however, will continue to work on the people who are already working on climate change and who are already devoted to climate change. And so this image is a problematic, you know, image. It does not mean that you don't use this image, okay? But it does mean you use it wisely, you use it carefully, and you know who your audience is. This will rebound, for example, with conservatives. And one of the reasons this image does not test well with uh, conservatives is because what this tends to encourage is a sense of the plant in them as they see it, and Dan Kahn would likely address this, is they see this image of the halalization or adulation or, or uh, yeah, halo, halo, halalization? Apotheosis, that's better, get out of that. The apotheosis, you know, of the, of the planet as separate from people and as separate from social values that are important to them and as separate from man and nature. And as such, they're big, they're really, uh, you know, uh, their virulent objection to the environmentalists as the as is that environmentalists in their strategy tend to put nature on its own footing in its own autonomous space and then begin to define all of their communication strategy on protecting that autonomous space and protecting its pristineness. Okay, that, val that is a value system. Okay, and there are values implicit in that. Okay, it is not a, and, and there are certain universals the, that, that, uh, that there are certain universals that are accepted by environmental groups that constitute that view. The universal first universal, you know, is in fact that there is a category of nature that is separate from human human influence and humanity to which humanity is accountable. Okay, um, and. In that sense, what they see is a kind of the planet and nature being put on somewhat of a superior uh, position with regard to humanity. And that does not square well largely with the conservative ethos. You will learn to speak, hopefully, to that ethos you know, with increasing um, eagerness um, and success in the, in, the course of the, uh, in the course of the semester. And by the way, just raise your hands, you guys, with, with any, uh, you know, with any questions. Yes, I'm just, I'm just wondering if that image tests anywhere with younger people, because to me it was rising very little. It's, 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 the it's, it's, image, like, means very little to me. Yeah. I don't, I feel like it's not something that I would ever consider using. Well, good for you, yeah. But, but that's... Al Gore trots it out constantly still, for example. Yeah, but I just wonder yeah. how much... I think the way, there, there has been some generational uh, uh, studies uh, done, uh, particularly at CNN. CNN has done so. And I think that there is a group, and it's, and it's an interesting question, but by and large, people respond, and Dan Kahan, I think, will probably address this and you can ask him, what respondents write that they are moved by it, or they are awed by it, or they're made to feel sometimes small by it, okay, all of that. But there's a sense that this is such an iconic, there's a sense, Minna, when you read into this, that this is such an iconic image that people are actually writing something that they're not necessarily feeling, okay? Because they feel, they feel compelled to say good things about that image, being environmentalists, um, being concerned for the planet. They feel somewhat compelled and moved, like, how could I object, you know, to this image? How much it actually moves them, you know, to action um, remains, you know, ha it has not been tested, although Dan, I think, is in the process of doing some tests precisely on it. We can talk about that. Does that answer your question, or? No, I was wondering more generationally. But 
Well, so far, in the, in the groups that were tested, 34 to 56 and 19 to 34, this image still basically tested, t tested well, in that, they, con in, in that, in, in that they, they said that this image moved them and inspired them, and, and they didn't say that it moved, motivated them to action, however. Yes, Leah. I think, I mean, it, it came out relatively, rel I don't know, I'm trying to think about things, but like, if that image would move you more than other images, I'm trying to think of an example of like, a beautiful landscape. Like, that's, that's kind of a cool image. Or, you know, what other images they test? Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to show some of them in the course of this presentation. Yeah, Albert. Right. And I think it's really important that you know what other people that's right. might think about that even when you think that, that's, And that's the point of me, that's the point, that's the point I'm making. Yeah, Shane. I was just going to say, the, um, like when they first took that picture, it was a generation when we had first just gotten to the moon, when we started running right. outside. So that was kind of more the, the baby boom was the generation before us that we moved by. It. And now we've kind of, we have the idea um, that it should be. Well, I mean, to put it really, really, no, no. I mean, again, I don't want to dwell on this. I want to move on. But to put it, you're quite right. Essentially, what, what this, when this image first, you know, emerged, the, it, it was, it was, an, it was additionally designed to create enthusiasm for space exploration, right? And that is what essentially the Apollo astronauts were also, you know, sort of thinking and driven by. And that was the culture that it was from. Ultimately, when in Earth Day, when Earth Day began to you know, propagate this image, it was seen by physicists in, in, in particular and by NASA as a co-opting, in fact, of the image uh, you know, uh, uh, in support of sort of beatniks, hippies, uh, anti-Vietnam War protesters who sort of wanted to make a statement about the fragility of the Earth, the univer universality of the Earth, the awesomeness of the Earth, and our duty to protect it. So there was a big, there was a really a big fight as to who would own this image. And as I, uh, as I alluded to in the first lecture, as a result of that fight, this image was delayed six months from when it was taken because, because of fears of essentially it being co-opted and being used to support the counterculture. Okay. So essentially, to, to, to review, we discussed essentially to date the two models, uh, the, the two models of communication that really have prevailed: the information deficit model and information surfeit uh, model. Uh, the, the, we'll get into this. I'll go into this in a little more detail, you know, uh, in a in a few moments. But essentially, to review, because all of you are going to basically be practicing, you will not be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. These are still very valuable communication strategies within the framework of communicating climate science not necessarily values, okay? Um, and the idea, of course, of information deficit, even though it's of limited appeal, is just what you think, which is the more science and the more knowledgeably and accurately and clearly the science is conveyed, the more uptake, ultimately, you're going to um, uh, result, the more uptake will be the outcome. Um, there's enormous numbers of flaws in that, but it still has value, and the same with information uh, surface. So to go back to this, so as you're working you know, on your project, and you know, Dan will talk about this, I hope, uh, and if he doesn't, I will, there are essentially two channels of communication as part of humanistic, humanistic communications that you'll be following at the same time. Channel one is really the science itself, which is really still the information deficit model. That has its place in the story that you're telling, and it's considered a certain channel with a certain audience. It does not mean that all audiences will always get the science, okay? You can have an information deficit, sort of A plus version, which is all information deficit, which is essentially going to public policymakers and scientists, et cetera. But generally speaking, there will always be an information deficit component to each of your, each of your communications, and you should plan you know, for that. How that gets thrust into the story, how that gets directed, and how that gets managed is a separate task from ignoring it altogether. Don't, you know, don't ignore it. Okay. Secondly here. So here we have is sort of the state of what I call the state of the climate communications uh, union. Want to go ahead and read that? 
What we're trying to achieve is a fundamental shift in the way this country and the world produces and consumes energy. I'm confident that we will get there, primarily because I believe that we have no choice. But how long will it take and how much will we sacrifice because of the delay remains to be seen. That's Josh. There's, secondly, NRDC, Greg Whetstone. There's an awareness in the scientific community and the public that this is the most important and difficult environmental challenge we've ever faced. We're not, unfortunately, seeing progress yet. Okay, who goes first? What's wrong? What's problematic? This is the question with those communications. As regards, even what you've learned thus far and what you're reading thus far. In our second one, he, he puts it in this little box of environmental challenges as opposed to all challenges okay. together. Good sum it up, good, that's true. Someone else got it. The yeah. second one is, I remember in one of the, I think it was reading that it was saying that messages need to be two thirds hope and one third fear. And very much that is not the hope. Very good. Most of the fear. That's exactly right. Someone, okay, good. Let's go, I, I want to build on that. Someone want to build on what Maggie just said? Um, instead of saying we have no choice, Josh could have said, you know, we have a choice to fix it. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. What we're trying to achieve is a fundamental shift in the way this country though, produces and consumes energy. Okay, first of all, produces and consumes energy to Eric's point. This isn't only about how we produce and consume energy, it's about how we live, how we define our relationship to nature, how we define our relationship to each other, and how we create or don't create community, number one. Number two, I'm confident that we will get there, and this for me is key, okay? And this, if they came to me and my company, this is the first thing I would say. I, if they gave me this statement to assess. I'm confident that we will get there primarily because I believe we have no choice. Okay. You don't, a communication strategy that is designed to generate coalition, that is designed to generate engagement, okay, cannot be based on you having no choice. Okay? And this is, that's number one. There's an awareness in the science of beauty in the public that this is the most important and difficult environmental challenge we've ever faced. Yes, Eric, you're right, environmental challenge. But what's just as problematic? Important and difficult being put together. Okay? Now, you don't want to create false hope, okay? Now, this, these were both, uh, this, was the this was the lead for the CAFE project, which uh, NRDC CAFE project, and I can't remember what the lead is for the Pew, uh, Pew Environment Director. But this is, and I pulled these up, you guys, these are not anomalous environmental communication statements. These are typical environmental communication statements. And, there is e and here is one from Gus Beth in response to that. doing there that Josh, what's Gus going for that Josh and Greg are not going for? It's connecting it to everything else. I mean, I know it's obvious, but it's, it, it, in a lot of these things in terms of questions that you ask, they do have obvious answers, okay? But that's also part of communications, is finding ways to state the obvious in ways that ultimately impress, engage, and are clear, okay? That's exactly right. What Gus is doing, and Gus continues to do, is to draw, begin to draw social, cultural, political connections, you know, with the environment. We are all in this together, in a, in, in, in a sense. Interestingly, even though that is an ex extraordinarily holistic, some would say slightly new age, and certainly many would say collectivist, socialist, leftist, you name it, they can brand it negatively. Interestingly, as you'll evolve in the class, and I think it's, my guess is you've already begun to pick up already, this actually has a lot more consonance with a conservative view than, than meets the eye. Because what the conservatives are saying is, to go back to my Earth Rise image, um, Excuse me, the planet is not separate from human influence. We have sort of, we have a, this, and the planet is not in a superior position uh, from humanity. Humanity and the earth have been in a dialectic really since man came into civilization. Agriculture in and of itself represents a kind of in engine, engineering, you know, of the planet. We are in dialectic. Uh-huh. 
Climate change is going to climate change is going to change the planet. You're absolutely right. This is true. And in fact, we welcome acknowledgement that climate change is going to impact the planet. And moreover, we welcome the influence that man is having on changing the planet. Now that is an extreme view, and we're fighting that view to a, to a degree. But the fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is, conservatives also see this sort of seamless spread between humanity and the planet that Gus is seeing here. Yes, Shane? What's the integrity, uh, if I'm assuming Red Sky is morning his book, yeah. uh, of attempting to communicate that to an audience and not actually using John Muir? Because there's a lot of good quotes out there and a lot of good ideas that you could quote with, and, and leave the, the name out and make it, I mean, you should cite that and it's very smart quote from John Muir, but in communicating to those audiences, can you leave out, of course you that kind of And it's probably good because they, they don't need it, right? It's more impactful without it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, I just had to pull that from Dr. No, I'm really yeah. Yeah. Curious. no, no, you're absolutely right. It would be. Okay. Go ahead and give that a read, you guys. When environmental communications were first emerged, by and large, as you'll learn, as you'll learn in greater detail when you read Schellenberger and Nordhaus next week, by and large, there was sort of a mainstream established recognition that the environment was important. Essentially, environmentalists were, and environmental policy makers were sort of in power, all right? And there was a kind of institutional agreement you know, that this was a bit clean water, et cetera, that these were sort of important parameters that the government um, should, you know, adopt and act upon. As a result of being on the kind of on the inside track, this is the same area that NRDC was born, the same area that Sierra Club developed into a lobbying organization, et cetera. As a result of being on the inside, environmentalists didn't have the burden, because they were largely on the inside, institutional environmentalists, of having really to make the case. Okay? They didn't really have to make the argument. Okay, even to someone like Nixon, yes, he was kowtowing and pandering to some degree, but it was kind of a given. You don't want pollution. The, the Cuyahoga River, you know, exploded in 1969 in fire. There was sort of a broad consensus that pollution wasn't good, clean water was important, uh, toxic waste was a bad thing, nuclear power was problematic. There was some kind of cultural consensus. As a result of that, environmentalists developed a code of communication and a way of communication which was which is seen now as instrumental. They were policy literalists. Okay, they simply had to communicate policy in support of a position which was general consensus. They didn't really have to sort of engage in values because we basically were all, you know, uh, we were all uh, in, in, in agreement. And so what that, de what that did, however, and I have a slide here before about policy literalism. Let me see. Where is it? No, okay. I must have pulled it out just before class. But essentially it is, and it is considered now, there's a name for it, and it's called a policy literalist communication system. This is exactly what NRDC still pursues. Okay? So NRDC and your NRDC groups, for example, will say to you, we want to promote our NRDC-backed architected policy you know, on behalf of the Obama administration. And, you will say, and we want to create public engagement around that policy. Okay? And you're going to say that is not the best way to create, the, 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 the best way to communicate this and work with you is not to create public engagement around policy, but create public engagement around the principle, the values implicit in the policy, the outcomes, the benefits, the opportunities, etc. You guys, it may sound obvious, that is a sea change. Okay? And NRDC knows that they want to move from policy literalism. Now, that doesn't mean, drag a horse to water, that doesn't mean that'll be easy. Okay? But you do it anyway. Okay? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to be put you know, in front of them. So they're very much steeped in sort of a policy literal. And what that does okay, is essentially confine them to working within the channels of government. And you guys, that's great when government's on your side. 
But when government isn't on your side, which is where they are now, you're the odd man out. It's exactly where the environmental NGOs and environmental policymakers are now. And they're still hewing to a communications modality which is based on them thinking they're still on the inside. And they're not. Yes, ma'am. What would you say about the fact that all of the major environmental legislation in this country has been passed by people who are not on the inside, that all of the legislation Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know it's, 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 it's really interesting, and what I, what I would say that speaks to up until now is the degree to which there was consensus around sort of environmental priorities, which even conservatives knew they had to engage in order to win elections. You know, and that consensus has now been sort of, you know, disrupted, and that consensus has now been broken. But I, that's the only answer. That's probably not the best, that's not the best answer necessarily, but that's my answer. Yeah, it depends which. Yeah, right. Good. Okay. So let's look then from. Yes, Leah. I just want to ask about like, an example like citizens' climate lobby, mm -hmm. which I know like, the undergrad class is working with. Right. Because they are about like, uh, promoting a specific policy instrument. Right, they're com right but, for, but, but what they're doing is they're connecting a policy instrument which is specifically carbon fee and dividend, which has a component of essentially making a redistribution of wealth. Okay. So essentially, they are not re they're promoting policy, but they're promoting policy that has a huge social value to it that is separate and apart from the environmental benefits. We're going to make you richer by fighting carbon. <laughs> you know? So what policy literalism, as defined as a communication team, what it does, these are essentially, this is what constitutes, this is the universe of policy literalism and communication. Through stories and citizens' policies, environmentalists constantly reinforce the sense that nature is something separate from and victimized by humans, as we just discussed, right? And think of the verbs, sorry, the typo, associated with environmentalism and conservation. Okay? We did a three year study when we went to the Discovery Channel where we were trying to figure out how we could get revenue for environmental programs, how we could get users, how we could get subscribers online, how we could get advertising, right? So we did a three-year study basically asking people sort of what they felt about environment, what, what were words that they think defined environmental messaging, okay? And this was right, left, and center, okay? It was equally, it was equally divided. We were inside the group, we did not designate, um, but, the, but the group was evenly, divi evenly divided. These were the top eight, it should be eight, one, two, three, four, four, yeah. These were the top eight words. Yeah, sure. In, um, in that research and in the West, did you see anything about future generations or in, in, in the what? I'm sorry. In that research project, yes. you picked up these words. Yes. Did you see anything communicating about the future? No. This was what this was. What this was the project was we basically gave them 300. So this project was devoted to what was wrong with environment. What we wanted to diagnose what was wrong with the environment. Environmental. There are other projects, one of which I'm working on now, and you'll see. The beginnings of that later on in this presentation, which are words that do work, okay, um, um, and, uh, and and that would define sort of the new humanistic communications. But basically, what this was is environmental messaging to date. This was about two, up to 2012. Environmental uh, to date. There was 300 words we gave them. What are essentially your top three that define environmental messaging as you perceive it, or environmental programming, actually more accurately? And these were the words. Okay. And by the way, my, just so we're clear, when you talk about policy literacy, we're not only talking about policy makers, we're talking about people like me at the Discovery Channel that we're basing our communication modalities on those exact same communication principles, okay? Inconvenient truth is policy literalism. Yeah, he dresses it up and he gets up on a ladder and all of that kind of stuff, you know, but essentially it's a policy literalism communication approach in which you're trying to sell people, so, uh, you sell people on the science. The last tagline in the end of Inconvenient Truth, you know, 30 seconds, what can we do? Well, okay, you can buy some light bulbs, you know, um, you can buy some carbon offsets, um, okay, and it's, and it's in the tray, it's in the crawler, right? And that is because 
And that is not because there's anything wrong with Al Gore or wrong with Davis Guggenheim. It's because, guys, the communication model that they use to rack inconvenient, to trap them, in, you know, trap them into essentially not transcending sort of a policy approach of the science to, to, uh, to, uh, of, of, of global warming. Right? There wasn't really the room, there wasn't really sort of a coalition mentality, you know, you know, around that. Okay, so to, humanistic, so what is humanistic communications? Humanistic communications is an attempt, and I know you guys know this is where we're going uh, anyway, uh, but it's, it's a humanistic environmental communication is necessary to serve society increasingly in dire environmental straits. The increasing frequency of environmental crises and the pervasiveness of technology-based communication open up a gap a profound need that environmental communication oriented toward human welfare and connection must meet. What we're looking for here, okay, is essentially a communication system which is largely based on humanistic psychological frameworks. And what humanistic psychological frameworks, and you'll be seeing, you know, I'll, I'll give you some examples of this as we evolve, it's fundamentally interested in the subjective human experience. Okay, how, we're, and that what we're going to focus on is how do you experience the idea of climate change, which is not the same necessarily as how you experience climate change. Okay, how do you experience, how do you invest, how do you participate, how do you engage, how do you share, how do you act upon, how do you advocate for your idea of climate change. Back to the first thing I said in class, climate change is a story, okay? And largely because climate change is, to cut to, you know, the, to the risk of being too reductionist, largely because climate change is invisible to many, it becomes, you guys, a whiteboard upon which all of people's cultural fears, anxieties, phobias, sorrows, griefs, joys, ambitions, political stakes, values, by all of this becomes projected on. Okay? And, it, and so what we're dealing right now, and what we're really fighting over is not the science. We're fighting over the story. Okay? And climate change is the terrain of the, in, the, in which that battlefield is happening. That social, cultural battlefield is happening. And what we're being asked to do with new humanistic approaches is to step right into that battle and begin, and, and begin to communicate different ideas of climate change what, and, and different approaches to climate change based on those ideas. And you'll find that it represents you know, a, a, a compromise from a compromise in terms of moving away from this sense that, that climate change is affecting the planet, it is affecting nature, it is affecting biodiversity, and the, the idea here is to say, okay, we all know this. So what is the relationship between your idea of climate change and a better life, a less good life, deprivation, flood, drought, food, spirituality, cooperation, collusion, etc.? We're not talking about one or the other. We're talking about marrying that NASA animation on the, the left and the right. Okay, so talk to me a little bit if you can, please. What does this image on the right do for you with the flood, the typhoon in Mozambique, the recent typhoon of Mozambique, in which obviously we can't pump, we can't point to any single event of climate change, but we can talk about the trends. You know, and the, and the, for, the predicted uh, increase, uh, of, 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 of increase of, and intensity of typhoons and the frequency and, of typhoons. Got that. Okay. What does this do for you? There. Right. Right. Of course. The, it's, real, it's really simple. This suggests a story. This suggests a narrative. What if that were my dog? Did I, did he go back and get that dog? Is it his dog? Did they cross, did they, did they get, did they, did they get to, did they get to safety? 
Would I do the same thing? What do I feel about that little boy? What kind of parents did he have that, that he would have gone back to that dog and that dog is so important and good parenting? What happened to that boy? What happened to his village? Okay, now, point is, in traditional climate communications, okay, again, I'm going to state the obvious, and I know you can, a lot of this is, I hope, about sort of me helping you language what I guess you're feeling already. And that is this. <clears throat> there was some minimal coverage about the possible connection between the climate change and the typhoon, all right? There was about 500 stories like this, okay? This was a local story. A climate change communicator who had been on his toes and who had been, and who had been sort of tuned or practiced or committed to humanistic communications Okay. would have tagged this immediately, guys, as a climate change story. This didn't get any coverage as a climate change story whatsoever. And it's a climate change story. Now, channel one, channel two, how is it a climate change story? You have the boy's story. You have a beginning, middle, and end of this story. Nobody interviewed. And by the way, the, a the, the AP knew, could identify this kid. All right? And there was local radio coverage of this kid. It was not like this kid disappeared into the ether. Not one reporter anywhere in the world interviewed it, explored it, exploited it, distributed it, identified it as having any kind of importance because it wasn't a climate change story. And why, they would say, why isn't it a climate change story? Well, okay. Can we connect the typhoon to climate change? Well, no, but there's lots of stories about the possibility of connecting the, the climate change uh, uh, to uh, climate change science uh, to the typhoon because it wasn't recognized as being one. Right? And based on even what we're talking about here in class, why was it not recognized as being one? Because it wasn't about the phenomenon. It wasn't about the science. It wasn't about the event of climate change, right? Or it wasn't even about the debate as to whether it was about climate change or not, okay? This is a perfect example of a story about the idea of climate change. What about if anyone would ask that little boy about climate change? What about if he knew nothing about climate change? What about if the story was, well, you know what? We're going to basically generate communications about building levees, or, or, you know, or, or making it possible, wall, whatever has to happen, so this doesn't happen again to this little village and this little town. And let's engage around that. And let's create a communication around that. And let's create an action around that. People don't even need to know that climate change is, 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 you know, is, is connected to that in order to generate action to make sure that doesn't happen again to the little boy. Think about that, particularly in NRDC, um, in the NRDC project of the kinds of things that you're going to be exploiting. So what we have here is a dumb little slide I did. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to imagine. I actually went back to the last yeah. slide. So the recent story that was going around the internet about the man who walks 21 miles or 24 miles to work every day. Yes. 26, yeah. So that would be an example totally. of totally. communication. Totally. And they picked up on his story and then they used that to talk about communication. Totally. Business. Absolutely. Yes. That's right. And I have another example for you. I'll show you. I'll talk to you in a few minutes. The lobster boat story in Fall River. Yes. Thinking about that, what you were just saying in dialogue with the project I'm working on, uh, I guess the questions kind of come up of, you know, at what point and do you, at what point do you bring in language of climate change, mm -hmm. or you have to? I mean, how how far are we kind of entrenching climate change within these values, and how do you kind of judge that? It's a really that? good question. And, and that changes from story to story, but I'll give you a general rule, okay? And don't hold me to this general rule. But generally speaking, in humanistic communications, you can frame a story in a climate change context, but it generally, if you break a story into three parts, it's in Act 3, what's called Act 3, in the third part of the story, okay? Where you essentially say, here's this boy's story, you drive with this boy's story, you interview you know, you know, this boy, and then you ultimately have maybe scientists weighing in you know, on the, 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 the event of climate change, but what's driving the conversation is this experience with the little boy. Right? But generally speaking, 
It's considered what you finish with and not what you lead with. So go back to my silly slide, which I did on the train. Okay. What we have here, you guys, is absent, because we are stuck in this sort of policy literalist communication system, what we did is we swayed the other way in order to, it wasn't creating excitement, it wasn't creating engagement, it wasn't availing results, okay? So what we did is swing into the other direction and we moved to alarmism, okay? Which is, okay, so we're going to have them sober, you know, here, and we're going to scare the hell out of them here, okay? Because there really wasn't sort of anything, you know, in the middle. And both, both of these are really about planet-based you know, nature base. We're going to scare the hell out of them about the planet going down. This will be the global warning. Okay? So we're trapped between sort of scaring people about, you know, sort of the planet going down and essentially having very micro-focused, technocratic, utilitarian sort of messaging, you know, um, about, uh, about the phenomena, the scientific event that we call climate change. So we weren't at all entering into the idea of climate change. All right? This is a slide that, to your question, Raymond, as you were asking um, earlier, this was a slide that was in the same suite as the Earthrise image. This slide generated, we had like 30 different slides. I'm going to share them, some of them with you another time if you like. But this is the slide that generated the highest. Okay? And we put it forth as... So we, we would put it forth as a slide, and what, what feel, I think the question was, if I remember, what, you know, what feelings in you does this slide generate as regards the environment? And the answers were, the top three were, exactly what we have hoped the Earthrise image would do early on. Okay, when we, when we, you know, exactly what Al Gore, when he puts the Earthrise image up, hopes it will generate. Now notice, you don't have to have people. This doesn't have any people in it. So how does that image in you generate awe, beauty, and character? So which, by the way, those ABCs, those are the defining characters of the, of the humanistic communications that a humanistic communication is designed to generate on behalf of, in this case, sustainability, science, and climate change, awe, beauty, and care and compassion for each other and the planet. Why do you think this image generates the highest? What is it? Right. Uh, instead of actually enjoying that. Okay. We we good. We had a social scientist uh, decode the results of this, and what she said. This think what I said about a few months ago about the idea of climate change. This allows you to imagine a path that you are a part, you're in this. You can project yourself into, you belong here. That path is yours to imagine. A path forward is yours you know, to imagine. You, you don't have to actually physically have another person in this image to actually begin to imagine a path for yourself as a result of this image. All right? What this makes room for is what, does the, what is your idea of climate change? And, and suggest that whatever your idea of climate change is, that it will move you forward through the woods. It provides hope. And it provides hope because you're in it, in your imagination. So one of the, th one of the things that, this is particularly interesting to me, because a lot of my work is devoted on climate change exciting the imagination rather than depressing the imagination. Climate change opening up options rather than closing off options. Okay, so as we begin to move towards Dan talking to us in, uh, a little bit, this is a further extrapolation, guys, of the information surfeit and information deficit models. It's a further detail and it's going uh, more vertical. <clears throat> the 
rational weighter model, which is sort of the analog for the information deficit model, posits that members of the public, in aggregate and over time, can be expected to process information about risk in a manner that promotes their expected utility. Does someone want to decode that a little bit? Think of information deficit. Someone want to talk to that? Let it absorb? No? OK, the idea, yes, Shane? Maybe that um, whatever happens, we'll still be able to find benefits in that and establish new systems that work within it. Yes, and it's also, it, it, it's all similar to the information deficit model. We're basically saying that rational people can be expected to behave rationally, you know, about the risk of climate change. That's what we're saying, okay? Rational people can be expected to make rational decisions as regard the risks of climate change. The irrational model is a little more complex and isn't exactly the same as information survey. But the irrational way model asserts that ordinary members of the public lack the ability to reliably advance their expected utility because their assessment of climate risk, you can put that in there, their, their assessment of climate risk is constrained by cognitive biases and other manifestations of bounded rationality. What that means, essentially, is people are going to be expected to behave irrationally as regards climate change and change, and will make irrational responses as regards climate change. And an example of an irrational response will be a denialist or a skeptic. skeptic. Okay, based on irrational fears of climate change, uh, irrational, fear, irrational fears of national security, having their guns taken away, you know, whatever it may be. Now, the truth of the matter is, yes, Shane? What happens to the, what, what about in between where you have the rational person, but to, they're not influenced by the fear, but they believe that it's out of their control? Okay, that. you're getting to right to the next slide. Very good. The fact of the matter is, both of those models, the rational wear model and the irrational wear model, have been basically the defining order of environmental communications to this day. Neither, as Dan Kahan is about to tell you, are true. It is not true that the more information you have and the more rational you are, the more rational decisions you'll make about the perceived risk of climate change because you're rational. Okay? It is not true. It is also equally not true, and this is, this is the key to what we're about to go to next, is that someone who rejects climate change based on what are perceived as irrational inputs is not so irrational after all. That's the big leap, you guys. And for me in my work, this was the biggest jump. Can you say that again? Yeah. Um, that those who we have, uh, I'm not going to say exactly the same, but those who we have traditionally dismissed or categorized as having an irrational response to climate change, as in rejecting it outright because they're going to take away my babies, you know, it's just something like that. Or, or all climate change scientists are socialists and they want global government. That was considered sort of an irrational response, okay? And we were treated it from a communication systems as an irrational response. But it turns out the, it, that is not so, their rejection of climate change is not, re, is not so irrational after all. Because what is, not, what is driving them is not an irrational rejection of climate change science based on sort of those fears. What's driving them is a very rational loyalty and adherence to the cultural group to which they identify. They want, and, and their response to climate change is in accordance and incongruent with the cultural group with which they identify. It's a, their response to climate change is a way of reinforcing and belonging to, and their sense of belonging to, the cultural group with which they identify. Be it a tea partier, be it an evangelist, it's a very rational response because no one wants to be excluded. And as soon as you make that leap from respecting them, as hard as it may be, as being something better than irrational. And you begin, we all have codes and cultural cues for our groups. And as soon as you step in 
and you recognize, appreciate, and respect the rational investment that they have in belonging to their cultural group, you then begin, can begin to work with that group. And you can step inside. We all share that, you know? We don't share the values of that group, but we all share that sense of loyalty. And so then you begin to say, okay, so their responses are based on their adherence, their loyalty, their fear of being excluded, their wanting to be in that group. So then you say, is there a way that climate change can connect in some way to the values of that group? And you start that. And guys, it works. <laughs> and it's powerful. And it's beautiful. And it's ABC. All beauty characters. And that is what all of your projects are devoted to. That is why the stakeholders are here working with you. Okay, and that is what each of you are going to be deputized to do. Yeah. Do you have an example of it working powerfully, Yes, I have several. And, uh, uh, let me uh, keep going and I'll address that. Yeah. Just to say, I do right now. Go ahead, Don. Go. Um, you know that South Carolina is one of the best growing solar markets in the country. Did you say so? Uh, one of the best growing solar energy markets in the United States is South Carolina. Um, probably the third part of the United States. Um, and one of the big reasons is because being sold there as getting off the grid, getting off of the profit uh, utilities that are getting carried through profit, and you don't want to be part of that. You want to carry your own and be independent. And so it's using that narrative, and it's, it, it's been a huge, a huge success in South Carolina. And it's all being driven by um, communication services in New York that is passively working with people on the ground who are some local communicators there. And I'll give, I'll give another example. What was that, Sarah? I heard the same. Thing. Yeah. And also another uh, another uh, you know example that comes to mind uh, about ten years ago. You guys know who Richard Sizik is? He's an evan he's an evangelist uh, preacher. Uh, Richard Sizik uh, and uh, James Hansen uh, spent several summers. They had little son. They spent a lot of time together. And Richard Sizik, of course, is an evangelist, and of course, all of his positions are within what you would expect an evangelist to be: anti-abortion, pro-family, against public schools, you know, all of this. And what Jim Hansen, God bless him, and I worked on this with Jim, you know, essentially what Jim Hansen says is, I want to find an in for climate change, sort of in Richard Sizik's work and ideology. By the way, end of stories, he succeeded. Okay, and Richard Sizik. Just in an interview as early as last week, he said, well, how can you be in favor of, the, and, and I said, what, what do you think about climate change? He said, well, I happen actually to be able to agree the liberals and the moderates and the scientists that climate change is truly a problem. I happen to agree with that. Yeah. And they said, well, you know, and then they said, well, and what about abortion pro-family? He said, well, I believe I'm, I'm against abortion. I am pro-family, et cetera, et cetera. And what he found, in this case, and this doesn't always work, and uh, the, I, I don't want the religious group to follow this track because it's too easy, but where the portal in to that world, cultural worldview group came was, it was the environmental stewardship, and the surprising one was the idea that the connection between uh, um, uh, what is it called, affluenza or runaway consumption and spiritual values, and the connection between runaway consumption and and you know and fossil fuel consumption and climate change created a name. So now Sizik can quite publicly and comfortably, you know, stay in his group and adhere to his world group. We're not asking him to belong to a different group. We're not asking him to come to our group. We're not asking him even to believe in climate change. We're asking him to take action on climate change in a way that is congruent in his beliefs. And rather than run, run away and say he belongs to a worldview that's the enemy, see them instead as a worthy opponent. And, 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 and nine times out of ten, they will welcome you in. Many, many more people want to figure out a way to engage on climate change, then don't. 
but we need to work with them to help bridge the communication partnerships that make that possible. And the tools are there, the tools are emerging. The reason I'm so excited about it, that's why I'm here, because I'm so excited about it. That's why so much of Dan's work and Katie's work also is basically on creating those bridges into those cultural worldviews. And what Dan's work, which you're about to hear about in a few moments, is really about essentially isolating and analyzing and assessing and testing those cognitive biases. And what your work is, is developing narratives that allow you to speak to those cognitive Okay. So, within that, it's, and, and this is uh, good because Dan's going to be on in a few minutes. Um, cultural cognition, of which you know Dan is really the, uh, in my mind anyway, the foremost proponent, is that it, it is that th that cultural values are cognitively prior to facts. Like it or not, like I said last time, the world does not change. Uh, you know, the world does not move on knowledge. The world moves on cognition. The world moves on belief. Okay, again, and I'm going to repeat it again for those of you who may have missed it last week because it bears repeating. Copernicus, Galileo, sun centered universe, persecuted, tortured, rejected chastised by the church, etc., 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 all of the above, all versions of what's happening now to climate scientists. Bacon and Shakespeare get together, and Shakespeare writes Hamlet. Hamlet is the first artistic, humanistic, exa an example of humanistic communications, is the first blending of science and art. And what Shakespeare did is create a vision of a world that was heliocentric. And what that heliocentric world sets a lot of characteristics, but what essentially it was constituted by was Hamlet as a young prince being unwooed. If I don't have God to tell me what to do, if we're in a universe that is much more chaotic than I thought, where do I fit in? Where do the hierarchies? What is my devotion to my father? What is my devotion to my mother? And this ennui that I'm feeling, this existential ennui, am I responsible for it? There's no God that's going to take care of this for me by simply following the ABCs of religious scripture that will take me where I want to go. Hamlet was unmoored. And guess what? No great Gasp, no great hopeful pie in the sky, vision about everything that's going to be great. What Hamlet was was a reflection of what people were already feeling themselves and didn't have a narrative, didn't have a way of talking about it. People were talking about with each other. People were feeling that the world was changing. Hamlet today is the most successful play that Shakespeare ever, that's, that Shakespeare ever did. And Hamlet became an iconic figure. Now, did people identify, oh, th that's a sun-centered, the, the science behind this is that obviously this is a sun-centered, no. But what they thought, saw was something different, and they saw themselves in this difference. And seeing themselves in this difference, like seeing themselves in the road that I just put up a few minutes ago, the path through the forest, the world culturally, the norms culturally began to change to reflect a world in which the sun could be the center of the universe and science could take the place of the take the place, or perhaps in, uh, or in partnership, or take the place of religion. And, 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 and it was from that base on, that it, from that point on, that, it set, that this began to take, that, that, that the idea of a heliocentric universe through to the Enlightenment began to take hold. In that case, the science now, you can sort of, you know, play, would, would we know today if the sun is and the universe were not to shape? Of course we probably would. But the point is, it is the marriage of arts and science, the marriage of sort of a humanistic application, a narrative which was reflected and informed by the science. Shakespeare is filled with metaphors, the stars, the new cosmology, etc., which indicate he was quite clear on what the emerging science was. That's the difference between.
That's the ah, shit. That's the difference between this and this. That's the difference between a science animation and a popular animation. And they are not mutually exclusive. And this is what Dan's work is so good about, Channel 1 and Channel 2, which Dan's going to probably talk about any moment. Right, Dan? Yeah, yeah. This is, I think, repetitive. You don't need this. OK. OK. So next week, you're going to be uh, the March 5th. Uh, it's not uh, next week, but you're going to be reading um, Michael Schallenberger and Chad Nordhaus uh, next week. Now, what's interesting about it that is, that, is that I could not possibly be in more disagreement with the political positions of Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schallenberger. Totally disparate. Okay? But as a communication strategy, you guys, when I divorce myself from my own political ideologies, what they have to offer is breakthrough. And a lot of my work is really based on much of the work, much of the perspectives that they have put forward. So this quote, in their public campaigns, not one of America's environmental leaders is articulating a vision of the future commensurate with the magnitude of the crisis. Now, the magnitude of the crisis does not always have to mean the magnitude of the planet going down in flames, guys. The magnitude of the crisis can't be the story of that little boy with the dog. The magnitude of the crisis is that climate change is forcing upon us a new, a, a, a new idea of what it is that our relationship to the planet and each other is and what our responsibilities are congruent with that. And what we're really not, when we say the magnitude of the crisis, is the magnitude of the crisis is what is, what is, the, what is the arena of the ideas of climate change that we haven't even begun to negotiate a space and bridges between. And again, it's, it's, we're not fighting over climate science. We're fighting over the idea of climate science. And there's good news, there's lots of room for lots of ideas, because climate change is a really big topic, and it's a really big framework for a lot of stories that can accommodate a lot of people. And so as such, what's to date seen as a communications albatross is really a communications opportunity to make connections towards the Anthropocene that we currently can't make because we're stuck, ah, I found the policy literalism slide, okay. That we're stuck between policy literalism and alarmism, which are our two basic communication models, policy literalism, alarmism, information surfacet, information surfeit, information deficit, rational uh, wayers, rational way in and irrational way in. Those are essentially where we are right now and where we are moving from. So the first wave of environmental communications that you studied really from the 70s on was really, we began John Muir, Abel Leopold, et cetera, was based essentially on a conservation ethos. And Maggie, to your question earlier, why did so many of these things move forward, even Theodore Roosevelt, right, Republican conservation, is because there was essentially an ethos, a consensus around conservation that made that possible. That ethos right now no longer exists for a host of reasons that are not the purview, beyond the purview of this class. We then moved on, again, because environmentalists were largely in power and largely had the bureaucracy available to them. They were insiders, not outsiders. We moved to, essentially, a communication based on regulation. That communication based on regulation, restrict, constrain, uh, eliminate, reduce, all those things that I told you, they're actually fine. They work when you're on the inside and your communication is based based solely on producing policy to regulate. Policy makers are the most impressed people around. Be as negative as you want, it works. <laughs> right? But we're not in power anymore. And so those strategies are based on us still being in power. So what will the third wave be? Yeshing. Yeah, Or do you think at the same time we should also look at trying to regain that power? Or are those two things the same? 
Um, not I don't know whether I lost the beat or whether the question is not clear. So just say it again. Uh, so we're no longer, we don't have people that support that in power. Correct. The communications models that we've been using have been basically basically uh, 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 built, uh, built on precedent that essentially we have like-minded policymakers uh, who are interested in regulation and that we will have policy discussions and that we will solve the climate crisis by essentially enacting policy. So should some of the effort also go towards regaining that favor uh, or should it all go towards identifying a new way of communication? Or it's really so. It's both. Because I think at the end of the day, one thing for sure, if you want to gain from a public policy perspective, we can, we must appeal to conservatives. Okay? Like it or not, just like we are, wind turbines are going to be in Nantucket Sound. All right? The pristine, natural, sacred, autonomous nature, it will change. All right? And I'm as much of a naturalist as anyone, and I have to come to terms with the fact that in order to solve climate change, we will have to all give a little, and nature in its most pristine form will no longer exist. Through a combination of damage that will occur, adaptation processes, sustainable development, windmills in Nantucket, wind turbines in Nantucket, it will all change. And hopefully, they'll become beautiful at some point, and not eyesores, you know, as we all, as we all evolve. So in answer to your question, I think the folks is if, you're, if you are on the outside and you do want to engage an, an unlike-minded policymaker in your, um, uh, in, in your in your vocation or in your uh, uh, into generating engagement on your issue, what you'll need to do is be able to speak to them in a way that they know their constituency, which belongs to their cultural worldview group, ultimately will respond to the actions they're taking based on your issue. It's exactly the same as reaching out to the Find a way, and there are ways to speak to that Republican congressman. Not all of them, but there are ways. But in order to even begin the conversation, we need to accept that this, that this very simple value of protecting the planet is not a neutral value. It is a political statement. And it is a political statement to the degree that it, that it is based on the assumption that nature is autonomous, nature is, does not interface with humanity, nature is in a superior position in relation to humanity, that seems like a scientifically correct statement. It seems like a neutral value. It isn't. Now, you can adhere to that value. I do subscribe to that value. But I recognize that it's a value. I didn't walk that way thinking that way, but I do now. And as a communication strategy, it is incumbent upon you to recognize that that's a value. Does that help? Okay, great. So I think that is it. So as your, um, this is the last slide for uh, today, before we turn the reins over to Dan. The environmentalists hope to become more than a special interest. We must start framing our proposals around core American values. Now, this is very ethnocentric, but this slide, this was part of a speech I uh, gave at the World Bank to American delegates, so it was very American, but it applies across the globe. We must start seeing our own values and our partners in communication as central to what motivates and guides our communication. In short, you're not speaking at people anymore. You're speaking with people. And what that means is taking a deep damn breath and understanding that your opponent is worthy of your engagement. And work like crazy. Do mental jujitsu. Do emotional Aikido. You're not going to connect with everyone. This, this is not pie in the sky. But I can tell you, you use this approach and you're going to make a difference with each one of your stakeholders in taking this approach. Because they don't know how to do it because they are stuck in the models that we're setting here. Political literalism, alarmism, etc. And we're looking for a dialectic, a dialogue, not a diatribe. And next week, Sarah, to your question, we will begin with another, a more recent story about the lobster boat in Fall River, which is an example of a good humanistic communication. We'll start there. Oh, there you go. Do you know about this story already? Well, next week you will. Okay. And by the way, Sarah, the fact that you don't know about this story is why you're in this class.
because everybody should know about this story, but stay tuned. I'm a media guy. I'm not going to give away the plot. <laughs> okay, Dan. <laughs> Do you want to the science communication problem? Right? And, and, and really, I've already sort of talked too much, right? Because I, I, I'd really just rather show you uh, like some data, right? Because uh, the, the, everybody knows a, a, a picture is worth a, a thousand words, but if you have a scatter plot with like 1,500 observations, it's worth like, I think, I don't know, 10 to the, the 15th words or something like that, right? But, but this, is, this is, I'm showing you what the science communication problem is instead of just telling you. But here, this is a, the, the, a scatter plot of the responses that uh, the, the, uh, the participants in a nationally representative uh, survey of almost 2,000 people it gave to this question, how much risk do you believe global warming uh, poses to human health, safety, or prosperity on the scale of zero? Uh, uh, to seven, uh, that's on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, uh, array the 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 observations, <laughs> the, the the participants uh, uh, according to their their left-right political outlooks, right, which you measure with a, a composite scale. You just ask people, well, how liberal or conservative on you, are you on a scale one to five? How strongly do you identify with the Republican or Democratic Party on a seven-point scale, right? And you combine those. And you, you can, you can, I don't know, I, see the colors, like the kind of red, orange, hot colors up there on the, on the left, kind of running down to the blue and green. You can just see, right? Can you see that? that, that, that that the, that's what it looks like if you have a R equals 0.65 or something like that. I mean, is, point, is R equals 0.65 big? You know, is that a big R or something? I, I mean, I, I was giving this talk once and, a, and an engineer said, well, if, if I had an R 0.65, the bridge would fall apart or something like that. You know, so you, you, that, that doesn't make sense. You, you kind of have to have some practical benchmark to try to understand whether any kind of, of correlation or correlation coefficient is big or what the meaning of it is. But here, here's a benchmark. The, the, two, the two items that I told you I used to measure the political outlooks, I, the responses people gave to how liberal, conservative, on scale, one to five, your, what's your party identification, liberal, Democrat, or Republican, one to seven, right? those correlate with each other 0.65, right? So the, the responses, the variance in the, the responses people are giving to this question right, coheres with people's political outlooks to exactly the same extent that the best ways to measure their political outlooks do, right? I mean, that's telling you something. It's telling you a way to measure their political outlooks, right? I mean, you could combine those three items now, right? I can't see what your political orientation is. I can just ask you questions that I think correlate with it, and then each one of those is noisy, but I'm combining them, right? And the, and the, 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 the correlation will amplify the signal, and, and the, the, the noise will cancel out. So let's have another item. You see, it makes it even more precise now that I've asked you about the, the climate change. I can even a better prediction of how you'll feel about Obamacare and you know about gun control and so forth. But another nice thing about you see this this measure, how serious do you think the risk of climate change is on the scale of zero to seven? I think the right answer is three point eight or so. There's no right answer. It doesn't really matter. You see, because the 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 responses that you get on this scale they'll correlate point nine. <laughs> with the kind of variance you'll see in responses to anything else you ask people about climate change that they can understand, right? Like whether, in fact, the Earth is heating up and whether human beings are causing it, and if so, whether we're all going to die and so forth and, and so on, right? So it's a kind of a nice, efficient way to, to assess what people's views are on any of those questions, you can just ask them the, the question, well, how serious is the risk? It's going to correlate, point nine with anything else you ask. But it also, like, it's correlating about 
as strongly with the political outlooks as the other measure does, right? So now I can form a really great scale if I just combine people's responses to the question, do you believe in climate change? And how serious is the risk of climate change? How liberal, conservative, how, what's your Republican, Democrat party orientation? They're all just measuring the same thing. Right? And at this point, I can explain what 90% of the variance on what people's views are on, on well, on something like, you know, uh, do, do you think when people possess guns, they're allowed to carry guns in public, crime goes up or down, right? I, I mean, this is kind of strange, right? Because, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's not like a kind of causal mechanism. Well, if, in fact, the Earth is increasing in temperature, then when you allow people to carry concealed weapons, that must make crime go up and vice versa, right? But in fact, people's positions on these, on these issues, they're correlated. And they also happen to be correlated with, well, measures, I can have lots of different ones, but if I just pick left and right political orientation, they're, they're correlating that way too, you see. Th this is the science communication problem. I mean, climate change is the most, I guess, conspicuous instance of it. But there are uh, uh, these issues where people are divided on political grounds, but on grounds that we understand to be measures of some kind of thing that defines them and orients them with respect to, well, issues of value. How much do you care about liberty? How much do you care about equality? Therefore, you must think that the Earth is, in fact, heating up and that this will happen when you have fra I mean, why would it be the case that, I mean, these issues are complicated, maybe, right? But the positions aren't, the, on, are not randomly distributed, right? They cohere with these sources of identity, these, these styles that we can measure in different ways, and they cluster across these issues. Well, why is that? <laughs> I just find that kind of interesting. You might want to try to figure it out, you see, and using evidence and say, oh, the science of science reason is about that. But also, it's not just interesting, it's a real kind of pain in the ass. <laughs> because, you know, you might say, well, we know there's, people aren't converging on the, the answer here. We know that that's a pretty bad. I don't know, maybe they don't know what the answer is yet on fracking or something. But I'll tell you, if they do figure out what the answer is, and we have this science communication problem, persistent division on these risks and other kinds of facts, on which there is compelling scientific evidence that's widely distributed, right, then they're not going to converge on what the best evidence is. Right? Well, so what's the problem here? Right? Now, Paul said, I mean, I wouldn't do this otherwise, but he said I should give you a quiz. Right? So it's a pop quiz. Right? I'm sorry about that, but, but it's multiple choice at least, so there's still some chance. You know, I'm going to ask you, what's the source? What's the cause of the science communication problem? But it's multiple choice. And even if you don't know, you can just you'll get it right by guessing. Right? A, public science illiteracy. B, growing, you know, the no, growing public distrust in science. Right? C, orchestrated misinformation. Right? Or D, all the above. Right? And you pick one, don't say what it is, because then afterwards, if you actually pick something else, you can say, oh, I knew it was that. Right? And you also you can say, oh, that was obvious. Right? Because all of these answers are obviously true. <laughs> but they're not actually consistent with each other. Right? You see, that there are more things that are, are plausible than, than are true, right? and that, that's why it's kind of good to collect evidence. Yeah, I'll give you the, start, start with the idea of public science illiteracy. Right? This, I think, is probably the, the, the dominant understanding of why we have the science communication problem. That, that people, people aren't really that good at, at making sense of the information on, on risk. I mean, first of all, they're, they're, they're science illiterate. You know, they, they don't know, is it that the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth, right? Actually, I think Fred Hoyle said that, that it's the same. You know, they had this complicated math. So, you, you really, but, but in any case, <laughs> they don't know that. They, and therefore, how they can't tell what scientists are saying. It may be easily confused by people who want to manipulate them and so forth. 
But another problem, you see, is that people don't think the way that scientists do. Right? Scientists, they are very deliberate, very reflective and analytical. They think slowly, right? As opposed to that members of the public who they think in a kind of affect-driven, intuitive, fast way. And as a result, they fixate on the more dramatic instances of, of potential harm. They see the, the, the fuselage of the airplane on fire sticking out of the, the, the skyscraper. And they overestimate that risk relative to the boring, you know, polar bear on a, floating on ice, you know, who cares about that and so forth, right? Even though that actuarially might be a bigger risk. And you're nodding your heads, you see, because this is not only plausible, these are real mechanisms of, of risk perception, right? They're, and so it's plausible that this could be the explanation. But there are more things that are plausible when you have these hard problems than are true. Right? And so you have to collect evidence. Right? Otherwise, you know, you're going to, anybody can do it. You just kind of reach, you take heuristics and biases, add water and stir, and you have instant decision science, right? And you can explain anything and be in the, you know, blogs and then in Slate or right, New York Times. You see, but more things are plausible than are true, so if you don't actually try to figure out which of these plausible things are true, you just kind of drown in a sea of storytelling. So is this one true? You can collect evidence, which we did in one study. We, we well, we asked a large sample of people, how serious do you think the risk of global warming is on a scale of zero to seven, right? And I already told you, it doesn't, there's not, it doesn't really matter, there's not a right answer. Well, maybe there is, it's 5.6, but it doesn't really matter, we're not, we're not using this to figure out if people know the right answer. We're using this as a, as a device to help us assess variance, right? Because we know that the, the, the answers people give to this question correlate 0.9 with this by anything else you can ask them. So if you find the sources of variance here, what explains who's more concerned and who less? Then you can test certain hypotheses about why it is that there's this gap between what the public believes about climate change and what the scientists do, right? So here now just the average member of society that the median, well, he can maybe make it a little bit bigger. Like this would be an average person, right, in society, right, average, average ideology, average age, average gender. If the reason that this average person will call Pat is, <laughs> at least Billy just laughed at humor. You don't know who Pat is? This is what that. But it's still even funny if you don't know who Pat is. Pat's funny. He's inherently funny. But, well, I'll say more about this. But the Pat's average, see, the, the, the mean person in our, in our, our sample. But if the reason the average person, you see, isn't as concerned about climate change as scientists say that he or she should be, right? If the average person isn't getting the memo as a result of the deficit in that person's ability to understand the science, right, or, or that person's <laughs> vulnerability to heuristic information processing, right? It, it, that, that prevents that person from actually appraising the risks in the way that a scientist would. Then you would make a prediction that as the person becomes more knowledgeable about science, as the person's <laughs> capacity to make sense of evidence that the person's proficiency in the kind of reasoning that's characteristic of the slow analytical system to thinking that scientists use, right, goes up, that person ought to become more concerned about climate change. The view ought to be heading towards what the scientists believe, right? You can test that prediction now by looking at the variance here and the responses to this question. And so in addition to measuring people's people's uh, perceptions of the climate change risk. We measure their science literacy, 
All right, with the NSF has the standard science literacy measures everybody uses. And we also look at their numeracy, which is a really an ability to make sense of quantitative information. Not just do math well, right? But to reason with numbers and to make appropriate inferences as you need to do to understand data and so forth. It's a very good proxy for the extent to which you use the analytic, conscious, reflective system too and avoid the kind of biases that are associated with over-reliance on heuristic processing, right? We measure that. <laughs> but it turns out that as people's science comprehension with the scale that we form by combining those, and they form a very nice scale goes up, it, it just isn't the case that they become more concerned about climate change, right? That that's just the, the trend line there. It's a 95% confidence interval. I don't know. Right? That, that looks flat, doesn't it? Well, so, you know, here, here's, the, here's the interesting thing. I, it's not the case that there's no relationship between people's science comprehension measured in the way that I described in their perceptions of climate change risk or the answers they give to these questions about is the earth heating up, are humans causing it? And so it's a big relationship. But the relationship depends, you see, on what the person's, well, what kind of person they are. And here I could just measure it again with the right-left measure that I talked about at the beginning. And the people who are more liberal, more democratic in orientation, they become more concerned about climate change risks, more likely to say that the earth is heating up and humans are causing it as they become higher in this kind of science comprehension. But people who are to the, the right of the mean on this scale, they become even less concerned, less likely to say that climate change is happening, that humans are causing it, as their science comprehension goes up. You see, that's not what you would predict if you were subscribing to the science comprehension thesis. You would think that as people became more science comprehending, well, the, the, the signature of the science communication problem, the polarization on these issues of fact, would dissipate. No, it's becoming worse, right? So, no, you know, I'm going to cross that one off the list. But, but, you know, nothing is ever final here. If people, people who say, oh, science has established this and proven that, they don't get how science works, right? All you do is just come up with evidence give you valid evidence, more reason to believe something or disbelieve it than you otherwise would have had, right? Put that on the scale and keep going forever, right? But here, I've given you, I think, some evidence that gives us less reason to think it's that than we otherwise would have had. So we go to growing public distrust in science because we all know that, of course, Americans, they distrust science, and we live in the age of denial. Everybody's denying everything from evolution to you know, vaccines working to, to uh, whether Yale is ahead of Harvard in the rankings. It's just unbelievable. It calls a creeping anti-science thesis. Cat. We all know it's true because we read it. Is it true, right? Well, you see, the National Science Foundation indicators. They, in, they have indicators for people's science literacy, but also their attitudes towards science. They collect this over time. It's, it's great that they do this. We can keep track of these things. You know, because again, well, if it's true, we have this, this creeping anti-science sensibility in the public. Well, then you, you might think that on this question, should the federal government fund science, right, that the agreement is probably going down over time and, and that the disagreement would be going up. Right? But what, what happens, I don't know, it's kind of flat, really. <laughs> or, well, but are we funding it too little or too much? Right? Capital, well, I mean, we're too much. Stop it. You know, we don't want government spending money on things. <laughs> and and the, the, the mod saying too little should be going down, but kind of the opposite happens. I don't know, it's kind of flat, really. Now, are those scientists public spirited? You know, scientists are helping to solve challenging problems. Agree on it. Well, that's a problem. There's at least 3% who say no. You know, our scientists are dedicated people who work for the good of humanity? Huh? Well, uh, you know, I don't know, 7, 8%. It's creeping up. 
it's not really creeping up, you know, like in 1987 or something, you said, how would you feel if your daughter married a scientist? It changes the son or daughter over time. But it started out like, you know, I don't know, like 80% in like 1990 or something. And over time, now, you know, it's up to 95%. They would say, well, that'd be great, your son or daughter, right? You ask about marry a lawyer, there you'll see that the trend line's in the other direction, right? People love scientists, and Pew issued a report last week, it just says Americans love scientists. But what about, you know, maybe those really, what are we measuring when we ask people that, right? Because we're just asking, do you like science? What we're trying to explain is why we have the science communication problem. Why is it that some people seem to be resisting what it is that science knows? Why isn't scientific consensus dispelling the kinds of conflicts we see, even if it's to the extent that scientific consensus is, we don't know yet, <laughs> at which point people you wouldn't think would divide up, hey, we'll just wait until you tell us. And, and maybe we'll see that there's a, that there are some people, the reason we have this problem is they don't, they don't care the scientific, screw the scientific consensus, right? So here, here's an experiment to, to get at this. We show people these scientists, you see, these are scientists. They all got training. Well, at least one of them got training in an excellent institution. The other one said, this is being recorded, right? Because Peter Salovey is said, they will enter my contract have to say something stupid like that. But you see, they're all on elite university. They're all members of the National Academy of Sciences. And you say, well, if you, you know, or your friend here says, well, I'm trying to make up my mind as a citizen on this important issue of the day. <laughs> but, you know, and I got one of those things by the book. But I don't want to waste my time getting information from somebody who doesn't know anything. Do you think this person knows anything about, is this an expert on this topic? Right? That's what we ask people. And we ask them, uh, that's what, another thing we do, we measure, I guess we've been talking about this a little bit, I don't have to say it much. Like, I'm, I'm going to delve into this much more this week, but that's just for my slides. Stop. Oh, so, I'm thinking oh you haven't said anything about this yet? No. So well, here, well, so we measure what we call their cultural worldviews. The, just the, the, the kind of preferences about how society or other kinds of, of, of collective enterprises should be organized right? along these two dimensions, right? individualism, communitarianism, hierarchy, egalitarianism. Right? You, you think there ought to be a lot of, of conspicuous rankings and authority allocated according to, to these social roles. Then you're more hierarchical. You think nobody should be able to tell people what to do just because of who they are. You're more egalitarian. You, you think that people should, individuals should secure the conditions of his or her own flourishing, right, without the assistance of the, the collective and without any interference from it. You're more individualistic. You think that the collective, on, in contrast, should be responsible for securing the, the conditions of individual flourishing. And that if individual interests get in the way, the collective ones are going to take precedence. You're more communitarian, right? And you see, we have scales that measure these things. And the science communication problem says, hey, look, we see that people are divided, right, in ways that aren't random. Like, these guys believe this, these guys believe that, across these issues. And, well, what is it that, who are these people? You know, why? And really, you can't see the thing inside of them that makes them that way. But you can ask them questions, right, that will correlate with it and, and have some kind of measurement. You can ask them about their political outlooks. You can ask them about their religion. You can ask them questions like this. They're all just alternative ways for measuring something you can't see. They're all just kind of models. They're like the Bohr Rutherford atom. There's no, you know, the, 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 the question is, how much does it help to have this picture of what the kind that these people are like inside? If you're trying to explain things, if you're trying to predict, if you're trying to, to manage them, right? And so we say, gee, people's, people's perceptions of risk are going to, to reflect and, in a sense, reinforce their commitment to affinity groups, the, the, the identity of which will be, be associated with the, 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 the 
the, the correlation the, with the, the intersection, right, with, the, with the combinations of, of preferences about how collective enterprises should be organized that's formed by the intersection of these two dimensions of world views, right? And you know, what can you do with that? And, and if you go out there and you do the observational studies, you collect the evidence and look at the correlations, you find, oh yeah, these hierarchical individuals, they're, they're more climate, they're, 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 they're skeptical about environmental risks. You know, why? Because, I don't know, maybe they think if, if, if that gets credited, then we're going to have to put restrictions on markets and industry and, and they don't like that, maybe, because not just necessarily, it's an, again, they have an economic interest. They, they think these things are manifestations of human excellence, right? P people controlling the, the earth through their industry, certain people who should be in charge are, and so forth and so on. And, the egalitarian communitarians, you see, they, they actually are pretty suspicious of markets and industry. Those are sources of unjust social disparities. Well, you have these kinds of preferences, but maybe they then will unconsciously motivate you to impute harm and to the things right, that you find to be contrary to your values or, or to reject the evidence that the things that affirm your values are the sources of those harm. That's the cultural cognition thesis, right? that people are, in fact, fitting information uh, about risks to their values in a way that then affirms their understanding of how society should be organized. And, you know, you can find that there's lots of explanation, a lot of correlation between this, these outlooks as we've measured them and these hot button issues you know, the kinds of things we all know, you, you just kind of careful, you don't get into a conversation about that if you don't know the person, because, you know, they might get really upset. And, okay, so here, we focused on these issues because we know that there's conflict, right, between groups in, in these quadrants, as it were. At least the conflict gets even stronger among people as they tend towards these parts of the, of the map here, the cultural map. And now we're showing them some evidence, I guess, of what the answer might be on these issues on which the, the groups are divided. Here's somebody, who, a scientist, who's going to say something. Would that be evidence, maybe, that bears on the issue <laughs> on which we know that these groups are divided? Well, you see, there's an experimental component. We tell half the people that the featured scientist is taking what we call the high-risk position, saying, oh, yes, with climate change, there's climate, this consensus, and humans are causing it, and we're going to die or take the low risk. Too early to say, you know, the computer models are not so reliable. We have to run them for several hundred years before they're calibrated appropriately. Don't do anything drastic. You laugh, but you know, actually took these right out of the writings so of people who seem to have these kinds of credentials, right? And the same thing with the nuclear waste. Very dangerous to put them deep underground. Great idea to put them deep underground. It's fun, you know. And, and or concealed carry laws. Oh, you let people carry the concealed weapons, and they, they, there'll be more violence if they get into fights with each other, or there'll be more guns lying around at home anyway. It'd be accidents go up. No, no, no. If, if people can carry concealed weapons, you see crime goes down because you don't know that if anybody's packing. He's a kind of like automatically nice to them and stuff. And you laugh. That way I can tell what your cultural outlook is, you see? Because now we, we, we find out that the answer people then give, is this scientist an expert on this issue, is conditional on whether the, 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 the scientist took the position or rejected the position that's dominant in the cultural group to which the experimental subject belongs, right? So we get these huge effect sizes that the, the, the egalitarian communitarian, 72 percentage points more likely than the hierarchical individual say, oh, that's an expert. When the scientist who was the climate putative expert on climate science said, oh, yes, there's high risk, right? And the, the higher than 54 percentage points more less, so that's an expert than the egalitarian communitarian. When the same featured scientist said, no, it's too early to say, you see? Big effect sizes here. <laughs> and, and, 
you know, it, well, what, what is this? What's happening here? And, and by the way, you might have wondered this. Why are we using all white males? Because, you know, I'm, it might very well be the case that uh, some of these groups view the kinds of characteristics like race and gender and so forth as bearing on the authority of people. I want to take that out of the equation, right? So I, I don't want that to be, I'm going to just, this are all white males, right? So we can see the only thing I'm manipulating here is the position they're taking, you see? And, and this is what's happening here. We show them some evidence, right? And, you know, Bayesian theory, right? You, you have prior beliefs. You get some evidence. You update your existing belief consistent with the weight of the evidence. This is a little different. You have prior beliefs. You get some evidence. You assign to the evidence weight, depending on whether it's consistent with what you already believe. <laughs> right? That's a way that you'll stay. You won't change your view then. And, and if, the, if, if the views of people are divergent according to their cultural outlooks, and they're all essentially conforming the evidence to <laughs> the, the, the weight they give to the evidence. That's an expert. Oh, he's not an expert in that. Depending on what position the person takes, they're going to end up polarized, you see. Not just on climate change, nuclear power, gun control, but on what scientific consensus is on these issues. Right? This is a model, okay? Because in the world, people don't <laughs> see any climate science. You say, you say, you say James Hansen, right? You go, oh, it's a shame that he died because we could have used some more Muppets. You know, they don't know who he is. They don't know that. But they do go through the world getting evidence, you see, from people telling them things and so forth and so on. And if they're doing in the world what they do in this study, crediting what people say about what climate, about climate change consensus is, when it's consistent with their worldview and dismissing it otherwise, then they'll end up polarized. It's a kind of biased sampling, right? And that's what we see. These people are polarized on what scientists believe on these issues. And the Pew study last week said exactly that too. You know, th but this helps us because it isn't the case then that the reason we have the polarization is that one group distrust scientists. Screw what the scientists say. Nobody says that, right? In, in a war, both, you know, God is on our side, but the other side is saying that too. Here, God is on everybody's side. God is science for these people. He's on our side, you idiots. And guess what? Well, I don't know if the National Academy of Sciences, if, if that's like, you know, Mount Olympus and Carl Cicero and the president, it must be Zeus or something. But if we use the National Academy of Sciences consensus reports as a kind of benchmark, each one of these groups is right about one third of the time, right? It's not that one of the groups is better than the other at figuring out what, what scientific consensus is. The group that gets it right about climate change is getting it wrong, at least against that benchmark on nuclear power, right? And they're both wrong about guns because the National Academy of Sciences says, that we can't tell, you know, that, that if we put together these complicated regression models and you have to specify them in a certain way and there are lots of reasonable ways you can specify them and you get different answers depending, so who knows? Oh, but there's scientific consensus these groups believe, right? Because they know better. Does one of them know better than the National Academy of Sciences? I doubt it. I think they're just both not very good. Well, they're both very likely to be conforming the evidence on what con scientific consensus is to these cultural outlooks. And so uh, I'm going to cross that off because they actually want to, they're motivated to believe that scientists believe what their group says. They don't distrust them. And how about orchestrated misinformation? You know, misinformation is winning in u university study. Fox viewers more misinformed, you see. And, you know, I think, I think actually we can rule that out because you know, here's the kind of understanding. Oh, there are these economically motivated interest groups and get controlling Fox and so forth, and they're, 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 they're confusing the poor, credulous public. But you see here, who's confusing? Who? We're just giving them what it should be. It's either valid information or it's not. And they're deciding to credit it or not, dependent on whether it will satisfy the motivation that they have to see that the position that is dominant in their group 
is in fact the one scientists believe. They're misinforming themselves here, right? And you should turn this model upside down. You have people out there who have this tendency to conform all manner of evidence to the position that's consistent with the one in their group, right? And when you have that, they're gonna, it's gonna pay to give them lots of misinformation because they want it, right? There's all kinds of misinformation out there. You won't get rich with misinformation about, you know, contrails because these groups aren't divided on that. So, you know, people are trying this, who cares? Give it to them on these issues on which they're divided. But it's the motivation that's creating the misinformation, not the misinformation that's creating the division, right? So I crossed that one out. <laughs> oh, that means I can cross this one out too, right? But so what's the answer? Oh, I don't know, we're out of time. I don't know. See, but this is the question. How did this happen? What's the cause of people being culturally motivated, you see? And now I'm just going to give you a hypothesis and evidence to another possibility, right? It's a polluted science communication environment. See, this is the science communication problem. You have the divisions on these issues of fact or risk, and they actually become larger as people become more science comprehending. That's not normal. <laughs> right? There are orders of magnitude more issues on which we are relying on science to tell us what the, the risks and benefits are where you don't see this kind of pattern than where you do. I don't have enough room for orders of magnitude, but I can keep going on and on and on. You see? And the reason we, have the, we don't have the divisions here, it's not because people know more about these issues, you know. Oh, if only the climate scientists were as good as biologists. The biologists came around and explained, you know, pasteurization so clearly. Now no, nobody's, there's not conflict about it except in some really weird enclaves. You know, the climate science. No, people don't understand these things. People think that if you take antibiotic, it kills a virus. Big deal. All they have to know is you go to the doctor if you're sick and take the erythromycin that she prescribes for you, right? You have to accept, as known by science, way more than you could ever possibly comprehend. You don't have the time to do it. And so you become an expert at something else, figuring out what's known by science. Who knows what about what, right? And you know, you know how you do that? You, you go and you look at the people around you who you hang out with, who you know basically seem to have figured out how things work. And you see through the attitudes they evince, through their words, through their actions, what kinds of information they credit as known by science. Your dog, you know, what, you, what do I do with my kid's face? You know, it's turning blue and swelled up. You know, doctor, you know, doc, Sanjay Gupta doesn't show up and explain to you. That's, a, you know, that's, that's gangrene. Let me explain that to you. Your next door neighbor says, don't give the kid an aspirin, idiot. Go to the doctor. You see, that's, that's called science communication. And, you know, it's kind of insular, really. People, people are figuring these things out inside of these groups because well, they hang out with these people. They don't get in fights with them as much. They can understand them better. They know who's kind of giving them the right story, who knows what's known by science, and who's bullshitting. It's easier to figure that out if they have these, these affinities with them. And it is insular, but it's okay, you see. <laughs> the groups, can, they, they're all amply stocked with people who know a lot about science. Science comprehension is a culturally random variable. If you don't believe that, if you think one of these groups is just stupid, another group is a smart one, I've done a study explaining why it is you would believe that about the other group because you're processing the evidence on that in a, in a biased way. They all have these people in them and they all have processes inside of them for transmitting what's known by science to their members. Because if they didn't, you see, if there was a group out there that consistently misled its members about what it was that was known to science that was really important for the group's members, the group would be dead, see? You don't even have to believe in evolution to get why that would be true. And so they all are pretty good at it. And they usually converge, right? 
because the smart people in those groups are getting the right answer, I guess. I don't know if it's more complicated than that, but that's a simple enough explanation, except, you know, when they don't. This is a pathology, both in the sense of being rare and in the sense of being bad. You have the science communication problem profile only when some issue that admits of scientific understanding becomes entangled in these kinds of social meanings that transform them into to badges of membership in and loyalty to these groups, a at which point, you see, you have a stake in, in, in essentially forming a view that's consistent with your group that dominates the one that you have in getting the right answer because you know on these kinds of issues it doesn't matter really the risk you face is not affected by getting the whether you get the right answer or not you can't affect climate change by what you believe about it you know what you do as a consumer what you do as a voter what you do as somebody who gives a, you know explanations and so forth it's not going to affect how much carbon output there is. It's not going to affect what we do because you just don't matter enough as an individual. Make a mistake in any of those capacities based on not getting the science, that won't increase the risk for you or anybody else you care about. Now, you make a mistake about one of these issues <laughs> relative to what the prevailing view is in your group, you see. Given that these are the kinds of issues we use to figure out what kind of person are you, you know, and do I want to hang out with you? Do I trust you? And so forth. That could be very costly. You know, Bob Inglis was the, the you talked about him, the most, world's most conservative Congress member ever. You know, it's like off the charts. And then he tells, he says, oh, I'm for, I think climate change is a problem. And his constituents in the 4th District of South Carolina kick him out in a primary, right? So, you're Floyd the Barber in the 4th District of South Carolina. And somebody comes in for the shave with the straight razor and everything else. Sign my petition on the polar bears. You'll be out of a job as quickly as Bob Inglis was, you see? Not a good idea. And if I go around marching on all campuses, climate change is a hoax. You know, my life's going to suck even though I have tenure, right? So it's in your interest. It's, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure these things out. But if you are better, you see, than average in making sense of the evidence, you can use that capability to do something that's in your interest, which is form positions that are consistent with the one that predominates in your group and therefore assure that you will enjoy the appropriate status, not make mistakes and so forth. People who can't do this, they probably, sadly, end up not doing very well in their social groups. Right? So it's rational. But it's also a disaster. Because if everybody does this at the same time, you see, then in a diverse society, members won't, the Democratic say, citizens won't converge on the evidence that, the best evidence that's essential to the interest of all of them in avoiding risk. But that won't change the stake that any individual has in continuing to form the information in exactly that way. See, it's a kind of a tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the science communication commons, right? It, these meanings that become entangled with the facts and generate this motivation to process the information this way, they're pollution in the science communication environment. They disable, make unreliable, the kinds of processes that people ordinarily use and use to good effect to figure out what's known by science. Right? Now, I'll give you an um, Two minutes? Well, if I only have two minutes, what I'm going to say to you is that, you know, you, 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 give you a practical example, the HPV vaccine, right? CDC recommends that, that we have the vaccination. You, you all know the, the, vac the HPV vaccine. There's a big controversy about it. And only one state, Virginia, because it's such a good state for growing the HPV. Because Merck, the manufacturer, gives them millions of dollars. It's the only one that has the mandatory vaccination, even though it's recommended. Right? And you say, well, you know, obviously, because you, you, you say, hey, you know, you're a 12-year-old girl in the backyard on the swing. Hey, one's going to be having sex next year. She needs to get an STD shot. Or she can't come to school, okay? Yeah, of course, there's going to be this kind of, you know, cultural conflict. You know, after the fact, I guess, how about the HBV vaccine? Hepatitis B, sexually transmitted disease. It is. And it actually kills more people than HPV every year. And the CDC said, put the vaccine on the, the universal list. And everybody said, okay, all the states did it, 
right? And in the years in which we were fighting about the HPV vaccine, the uptake rate was like over 90%, right? For teenagers and for toddlers. And it's still 20, 30%. Why is there a difference here, right? The difference is this. This was the polluted science communication environment in which people found out about the HPV vaccine. This was the communication environment that they found out about the HPV, the, just from their doctor, you know, and the doctors agreed they had the same expertise and they were all, you pick the one you trust. Why was it different? Because of, of a marketing strategy by Merck. Merck used the fast track, get girls only vaccine because only girls could have the cervical cancer. That kind of kind of weird, ready not girl, girls or STD shop for girls. They also had a, a legislative campaign to obtain the mandates in all of the states, right? A and because there was a legislative campaign, people are learning about this. So, oh, there's an argument, and there's something too for the groups that want there to be conflict to argue about a political issue. That's not normally what happens, right? What? First of all, you didn't have to have fast tracking. It would have gone within three years. It would have been approved for both boys and girls. Right? You didn't have to have the, the mandates. There would have been insurance coverage for everybody right, right away. And over time, well, what would have happened? You see, the, normally what happens is you don't have legislatures doing this. Public health officials who are insulated from politics, they get a memo from the CDC. It says, add this to the list. And a public health administrator in the state, you know, legislators don't have time to do this. They're doing something else, like filibustering things. They assign this to a, a public health professional who then puts it on a list. And then, you know, you find out, and you just do it as a matter of course. And you find out about this then from your doctor, right? And, and that would be good because the doctor says, well, I'm going to jab this in Jane or Jimmy. <laughs> just do it. We're out of late for soccer practice, you know? That, but that's, you trust that person. That would have been really a much better way to do it for the United States, but not so good for Merck because they're in competition with GlaxoKline to get their vaccine onto the market first, you see, and lock it up with all the contracts. So you take this risk. And, and you know, and this isn't just, you know, a story. We do a study that shows, we simulate what it's like when people are learning about the HPV vaccine, right? <laughs> we show them these experts, they just tacitly impute the values to them. And if we simulate a world like this, there's no polarization. But if they see people who they tacitly recognize as having values like they're saying one thing and the other group saying another, then they polarize. And they can polarize in either direction. Okay. That happened. It didn't have to. Right? It could have been different. And people saw this coming at the time. It's not even 2020 hindsight. Right? At the time. And they did these studies at the time, too. And you know something? It's not that the information was rejected by you know, some authority. Well, I don't care. Who do you tell? There's nobody to, to act on this information. We don't have a science communication brain. We barely have a science communication brain stem. It's nobody's responsibility to act on this, you see? So it's not E either. It's us. <laughs> that we, we live in an evidence-free science communication culture where these kinds of things will foreseeably happen, where we don't use the knowledge we have about how these things happen and how you could try to do something about it to prevent it. If it happens again, I don't have time to tell you about this, but it is going to happen again with childhood vaccinations because you all know about the, you know, that, that well, you all know that there's the, the, the there's not, it's not the case that we have falling vaccination rates. It's bullshit, right? Somebody didn't get the memo from the CDC that's telling them that every year the vaccination rates are holding steady at over 90%. They're not falling. Somebody didn't get the memo. Whooping cough was not caused by people refusing vaccinations. It was refused by a bad booster shot. Same thing with the measles, right? And then they're telling us, you see, that Oh, it's because of the anti-science people. People, global warming, you know, disagreement on that. People on both sides with the same thing. Same thing with evolution. There's your political conflict on vaccines, right? This is not a polluted science communication environment. You want to keep it that way. Right? You don't want it to be like this. This is what science communication environment pollution looks like. It's what assholes look like, actually.
Yeah. But it's not, if you blame them, you're not actually giving it out. We're not doing something about this when we could, right? Or maybe we are doing something about this, right? Right here. But I told them I have to stop, so I can't tell you what the answer is. But if you don't even know what the problem is, good luck figuring out what the answer is. I'm going to have some ideas about answers. But know what the problem is, that's the first and most important thing. And you tell me how to protect our science communication environment. Because I, mean, I, th I think we can. All right. I can't even tell you about this brilliant experiment, because I've been told we're out of time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Don't despair. There is hope. <laughs> Well, you shouldn't despair, because I told you, for one thing, there's nothing inevitable about any kind of information knowledge we have becoming entangled in these meanings in the way that climate science does. Right? Something happens to cause that. If something happens to cause it, we can figure out what it is. But also, we can control it. The HPV versus HBV is the best example we have of that. And that's accident, misadventure. Don't blame the media, don't blame the evil corporations, don't blame the religious right. I mean, there might be dynamics there that predictably can cause anything to happen, but it blame us if we don't do things. 